Professor Schuchert, you are a professor for educational research and adult education at the Leibniz University in Hanover. You were for many years a member of the German Parliament, likewise a member of the Evangelical Church of Germany, and you were a long-standing vice president of the UNESCO Commission. You are especially known as the author of the book The Voices of the Children of Chernobyl, History of a Quiet Revolution, about which we now wish to speak. On the 26th of April, we will have reached the 25th anniversary of the catastrophe of Chernobyl. Yeah, and as we planned, yes, and when we planned the program, we thought we'd be dealing with a warning signal for remembering. Now the torches from Japan have been inflamed, reminding the world that now is the time for turning back, for rethinking, politically and personally. In view of that, the purpose of the program recorded on the 12th day of the catastrophe and transmitted on the 23rd day will perhaps change. But I'm glad that we can share one fundamental message. Botschaft bin ich froh, dass wir sie miteinander teilen können. What is the fundamental message? The fundamental message that we can learn from Chernobyl and Japan is, I believe, that it's no longer possible to avoid the dilemma. Einstein said, we have passed the boundaries of the possible. That was in connection with Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Yet humankind always wants to surpass the possible. We can now learn from Japan, however. Perhaps I can begin with that thought and note how a population has responded humbly with respect for the situation, in such solidarity with one another, that we can only bow before them. I telephoned to Japan many times, and this encouragement, the fact that we recognised the situation they were in, was what helped people the most, not making suggestions what they should and shouldn't do. The culture of Japan is different. We can see that, for instance, in the culture of information with which we're now dealing. Completely different from Chernobyl. What then is the difference to Chernobyl? In Chernobyl, the motto was keep quiet, suppress, forget, deny. In Japan, they know that the catastrophe has happened. In Russia, the population learned from Finland what had actually occurred, which meant the liquidators went into the reactors unprotected. It was completely different in Japan. From the first day, the truth was made public in small doses, which would perhaps seem strange in Germany. In Japan, they do not brutally present the truth. All the steps that were taken were passed on in small doses. And one has to imagine that for the first time in 2,500 years, the 125th emperor, the Tenno Akihito, appeared before the people and expressed his emotions, his sympathies. And in the second message, he invited his listeners to interrupt him any time so that they could deal with the crisis together, the greatest since the Second World War. These efforts at openness are exemplary, completely different from what I experienced in Chernobyl. You call this policy of information exemplary. What happened in Chernobyl? I can tell you that on the basis of my own experiences. At the time, in 1991, I was called by the Foreign Office and the Permanent Representative of Germany in the International Atomic Energy Commission in Vienna and asked if I could travel there as someone who was a crisis expert, devise a plan as to how one could help relieve the trauma of the people involved. I wanted to do that in person and therefore or traveled there as a representative of the embassy. When I got there, the bus or the private car had either already left or had been available in the morning or had been there the day before. I was cut off from all information by denial or delays. And at that point, I came upon the citizens' movement for the children of Chernobyl, founded by the couple Grushevoy and Grushevaya, who accompanied me. They would provide a car, sometimes with only enough petrol for 50 kilometers, so that I could visit the countryside, the remote villages, the liquidators, and meet the families and find out what was happening. In addition, there were the lies of the International Atomic Energy Commission, IAEA, 
The IAEA was supposed to measure the impact. They claim there was no direct, only an indirect connection between radiation and illness. That meant that the global population didn't come to their aid, and all the doctors were instructed not to reveal the connection to patients for 10 years, or they would lose their licenses. I could confirm that in 60 interviews, and the biggest cover-up was my shoulder bag was stolen, my interview tapes were removed, and the bag with my passport money and jewellery turned up the next day in a wastebasket. That's denial, concealment, suppression, forgetting, right up to the present. But we now have the message from Japan as a current issue for the entire world. You participated in setting up a foundation in Germany, a partner foundation. Could you please tell us how you worked with the people there? As a result of the experiences with the Belarus Foundation for the children of Chernobyl, we, Helga Schenk, Burkhard Hohmeyer and myself, together with the federal government, established For the Children in Chernobyl, which is a bridge between East and West, which has now brought almost half a million children from East to West and from West to East over the last 20 years. We've built up a two-way system for encounters, support and education. And we can't thank those parents enough who opened their houses, homes and hearts. Children in Europe and Germany sacrificed their holidays and invested their personal allowances in order to provide children of the second and third generation with a German home home. They used the partnership as an opportunity to learn Russian and to visit the children in their homeland so that sponsorships and partnerships have ensued. What have the sponsorships meant for the children? It's a pleasure to relate what the children said. When they were asked, what does Chernobyl mean for you? Little Anna said, Chernobyl, for me that's Tatyana. And Tatyana, that's for me Chernobyl. And we two belong together like the rainbow in the sky. And the Russian girl on boarding the plane, when I grow up, it'll be the other way round. Then you will spend your holidays with us in Belarus. It was different with the children's parents, the guest parents who came over. Yes, it was a terrible time. They didn't want to allow them to travel. They didn't want the people to be infected by democracy. Who would not allow this? Well, it's obvious that the political system wanted to prevent any opening to the outside world. But I'd rather not discuss all that. Problems with visas, problems with passports, problems with medication, degrees of illness, old age, I could go on for days. What's important is that the courage of the parents made it possible. And then there was the culture shock theory. Could you perhaps briefly explain what this culture shock is? Was that not actually a denunciation of the organization Children from Chernobyl? Supposedly, the children, parents and those accompanying them from Belarus and the Ukraine received such a culture shock in the West that they would renounce their homeland and want to remain in the West. I questioned over 1,000 children and parents in West and East. The result can best be confirmed by the ambassadors who expressed themselves in a memorandum of understanding, which clearly states we needed this study by Erika Schuchardt. There was no culture shock. On the contrary, the children gained a broader outlook, a new impression of the enemy Germany, and on their return wanted to recreate what they had seen. Children expressed it in this way. I have to return to Germany to recharge my batteries, but otherwise I belong here in Belarus, in the Ukraine, in my homeland. We also have wonderful long-term studies after 25 years in which the adults say, I came as a child full of fear, I learned German, I became a teacher. I now want to present Belarus with a different worldview of Germany and to establish democracy here. I don't need to mention the difficulties with the Lukashenko regime. Everyone knows about the strains of the election. There's no need to discuss what's already common knowledge. The results are there. The initiative lives. Bridges of peace established, networks that are foundations of laws. 
Laws live in the spirits and the hearts of the people. And now, 25 years on, this network will organize a European tour through Germany with a peace march, a candlelight parade, a park of hope where flowers are planted. The signs are everywhere, but the signal from Japan is so much stronger than anything we could ever accomplish with a memorial service. What is the strongest signal for us today from Japan? I think it's a completely different culture, and it's a culture superior to ours with respect to solidarity, sharing and humility. I wish we had such values. And of course, as Christians, we do have the fourth commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself. The Japanese have a different culture. The collective comes before the individual. With us, the old Prussian values are forgotten or ridiculed. If today misbehavior or willful fraud is exposed, then it's called a trivial offense and the person resumes business as usual. There, honor is valued above all else. We all remember the interview where the Japanese firefighter directing the water hoses on the reactors wrote to his wife, and she tells him, please go there, be a savior of Japan. But for the spirit of solidarity to flourish among us in Europe, it's important to build up bridges of peace between Chernobyl, Germany and Europe, and between Chernobyl and Japan. It is important that we succeed in creating an animated exchange between young people and scientists, that we learn to share with each other the different viewpoints which lead to decisions. Maybe you could elaborate a little on that. What exactly should young people do for the world in view of this nuclear catastrophe? We know that we must turn it on or turn it off. That's clear to everyone. It must be turned off. Only that's not easy to do. We leave it to others, appealing to politicians and decision-making committees, the answer, however, must be found in relation to each individual person. When we take into consideration that we live in an event culture, for example, skiing in the city of Dortmund, artificial ice rinks in front of train stations, these are all tremendous energy guzzlers. Every family has a car, every child a PlayStation. We could make it all possible. Alternatively, we could also develop as many alternative energy sources as we wish. The problem, however, is not just assuming the responsibility for our generation, but for our children and grandchildren. Hence the famous discussion about sustainability. We're still in the UN Decade of Education for Sustainable Development, ending in 2014. Yet that has not made its way into the lives of every individual. There should be this turning point, but it can't be decreed. We can create energy quotas, but that doesn't change the inner attitude. You could point out the discussion that, for instance, the Kuril Islands of Russia should be returned to Japan so that there would be alternative areas for living in case districts are contaminated. But that also would not change anything. No one would listen. It's a matter of building world bridges of peace and facilitating the change through communication with one another from different cultures. You're known as an ambassador who has implemented so much in your personal life. I'd like to come back to that. You're a practicing Christian and were also for many years a member of the Synod of the Evangelical Church in Germany. What made you as a Christian tackle this initiative in Chernobyl? You know, when you're a Christian, you always want to relate faith to life, because you live it every day, today, tomorrow and in the future. There's no difference between Christians and non-Christians with regard to their actions, but maybe the reasons for their actions differ. What's been a great help to me, however, was that through the Christian faith, I acquired the strength to deal with crisis situations involving humiliation, degradation, injury and crises without end. I've spoken about the denials, etc., together with having the strength to reach out to the hidden God in the so-called evil person on the other side, and from this to acquire the strength to begin anew and leave everything else to God.
neu anzufangen und alles andere Gott zu überlassen.